brokerage. Got it. So the mortgage guys has been in business for 12 years. Uh huh. And then we started uh, other companies along the way. Okay. So the cool thing is like, for example, yesterday, uh -huh. like we get, we get income from a lot of flows. Right. So I get like escrow money. Yep. I get, yeah, there's you're, a, but, but you're escrow, touching different mortgage. sides of a residential. We're, we're not live yet, right? Okay. 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 So, so you're touching different sides yeah. of a residential processing, real estate. Mm -hmm. And and then we have the driven. So yeah. like, it's like drips from ev everywhere. And, That's and, great. and I, don't, I don't know if you uh, can relate to this, but, uh, like when in, in the beginning, when you have one business, it's uh -huh. like such a nightmare because then when it goes bad, yeah, you're like, that's your only thing. But as you yeah. start investing and getting into other things, then yeah. you, you just have it's yeah. a healthier life. Because I remember yes. like when I started the company, I was uh -huh. like battling heart attacks. And yep. it's, it's just been it's Stress. been a wild, yeah. wild, right? Yeah, it's it's tough when you start your business. I mean, um, when I started my business, I was 23 and I jumped right into the deep water, yeah. Albert. It was like start buying as a principal. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was challenging because I was dealing with a lot of people older than me and more experience, more capital. I didn't have money. I didn't come from money. And so for me, Sa I, sa I save it for the podcast. I will. I'll save it off. I'll save it off. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you'll learn a lot from yeah. me. And, you know, I'm here to help you, and especially with your business. And, you know, um, you have my cell. And you know, um, and what I do for a lot of people is a lot of people call me and ask for advice, and hey, I'm going through this challenge personally and professionally because, you know, I've been uh, I've been doing what I'm doing for three decades now, and mm -hmm. so a lot of people lean in and say, hey, even if like even though I'm in commercial and what we do, they're I'm buying a house, yeah, and I got this issue, and I want to ask for a credit. Is it worth going back and? give me your advice mm -hmm. and so i do a lot all these little things are like yeah. hey i'm putting this insurance on this property what do you think or I'm, i have this issue with employee what do you think and so because a lot of i can see directly what the issue is and say okay here's what i would suggest and usually yeah. it's it's fairly accurate yeah. and so i've been doing a long time so you know use me as a resource if yeah, yeah for sure we'll stay, we'll and it's you could be as vulnerable as you want from me i don't judge i'm here to help you yeah um i've probably been through struggles you'll go through or been through or we continue to yeah, as yeah. people it never you know, ends we're all, we're all the same it never ends um it's just like you know same thing with personal development i'm very into it i know you are as well and we have a, we you'll see we have a lot of things in yeah. common and yeah, yeah. through it and it'll be a good show so your your uh, last name uh, rainberg right reinberg 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 okay yeah you ready no yep. all right okay so you guys ready yeah, yeah. Hey, welcome back to Driven Channel. And I'm here very excited, uh, you know, to learn. I, I want to learn a lot from you, uh, Ben Reinberg. And uh, you, you're the founder and CEO of Alliance uh, Consolidated Group, right? And you, you, and you're a, you have a billion dollars in commercial real estate. So you do real estate in the commercial space. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you also raise, you get investors, right? So, yeah. so we'll get into that, like what the difference between what you do versus like kind of like what Grant Cardone does. I don't sure. know, know of Grant Cardone. Yeah, I, I know of him, um, I know him personally. Uh, but but uh, first first off, like Ben, who 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 is Ben? Uh, and I know you have a lot of experience. Yeah. You have a lot of wins. I'm sure a lot of losses too. But where did you start? Like like how how was your before you started this billion dollar uh, real estate portfolio? Like like who who was Ben growing up uh, in your childhood? Well, it's fitting that the name of this podcast is Driven, and yeah. that surrounds your universe because as a young Ben Reinberg and as a current Ben Reinberg, I've always been driven. I was a young man, Albert, where uh, I always wanted to kind of flip to the other side. I grew up in, in the suburb of Chicago, and I didn't come from money. But I would see people driving in Mercedes and, and people that had wealth. Yeah. And, I, and I asked myself, and I did research, I was a young man, I said, well, how do I build wealth? Mm -hmm. w what are they doing? And in Chicago, we have some of the biggest icons in commercial real estate between the Pritzkers and Sam Zell and the Crown family and hundreds and hundreds of successful people. 
and how they were able to build wealth through not only having businesses and companies significant, but was through commercial real estate. That's how they got started. So God isn't making any more land. And I realized I need to get in this business. So I decided, I said, okay, well, I have a financial mind and financial background. When I was eight years old, I tell this story. I used to sell cigarettes in a bar um, in Highwood, Illinois, which is a suburb. Right when you were eight? Where, yeah, when I was eight years old. That's how I started making money. Outside of the bar, right? No, in the bar. Oh, you were in the oh, bar? Oh, yeah. We were allowed to go in the bars when we were kids. Mm. And they were open. Uh, they were mafia-owned. And so I would buy a carton of Marble Reds or Marble Lights. Um, I would hand a guy a few dollars. He would go buy me a carton. And what I realized is I broke up the carton. I could sell individual packs. I could undercut the cigarette machine. Well, Albert, if you think about eight years old and you have mafia owned bars, it's not a real good idea to be undercutting their cigarette machines. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not well thought of. But I was eight years old. I was looking for money. I love candy. Okay. I am yeah. a sugar addict. So um, when I was a kid, there was a 7 Eleven down the street. So I would go get Slurpees and Snickers yeah. and Skittles. Did, and you did, know. did you ever try the, so, the, nickel, uh, the nickel trick? No. What's the no? nickel trick? So, so when I was like like eight, seven, uh -huh. yeah, I used to get nickels, uh -huh. and I used to get a hammer, uh -huh. and, I, and, and you would just hammer uh -huh. it, and uh -huh. it'll, it'll turn into a quarter. Really? Yeah. Wow, where were you back in the day? You're, you're yeah. th now that's advanced. Well, I, I was a little kid, and, and I would get the nickels, uh -huh. and I would smash them with a hammer, uh -huh. and they would turn into quarters, so I would go in there and get newspaper and cool things wow. like that in the, and the, and the little machines. Wow, yeah. I never knew you could do that. Yeah. Okay. You probably can still Well, I'm do not going to do that now, but, <laughs> you know, but I love that idea. So I was creative. I knew math. I've always been really good at math, Albert. And so that allowed me to know, like, what was it like to be an entrepreneur? When I was a kid, entrepreneur wasn't a real word out there. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm 54, and I grew up in the 70s as a kid in the 80s. And But it taught me work ethic. It uh -huh. taught me... You know, whether I mowed lawns, whether I shovel snow, whether I outsource it to people and create a business from it, I always did something to make money because I always wanted, I was so driven in life, and I still am, is I wanted to control my own destiny. I never wanted someone to tell me what kind of ceiling I would have on making money or that I wasn't good enough to buy the Mercedes. You know, when I was a kid, you know, I was bullied at, at times. I had two older brothers, and I grew up in a neighborhood that was kind of like The Outsiders, the movie. It was a really tough neighborhood and a lot of fighting. Uh, we had an ice rink across the street and a park I used to live where uh, people would play hockey. And so you had to be tough as a kid. And it taught me a lot about life. And so, but I also would have, you know, some of my older brother's friends I'd play sports with, they would push me around and bully me. And I realized, I said, well, I'm not going to treat people like that, but I'm going to be better. And I'm going to use success and money to solve my problems. And that's what I did. And I was always driven and always had jobs. And then I said, okay, well, I need to get into a good university because that's, that's what everyone did in Chicago. And so I worked hard. I got into Indiana University. It was one of the best business schools. It was in the top five when I was graduating high school. And when I got there, I didn't become more driven. I had to realize, like, okay, you're with a lot of talented people, people that want it bad to become successful. So I got my accounting degree. And my mother, who's been a real significant role in my life, she said, get an accounting degree, graduate, get a job. Uh, in 1992, when I graduated from Indiana, it was a deep recession. And it was tough to get a job. I got a job with an accounting firm. First week, they put me on audit with a billionaire. The guy invented cable. Mm. And I used to have dinner with him on the audit. I would sit in his office, ask him questions. And he taught me a lot about life. He taught me about what it would mean to take a risk to start a business. And he told me, he said, you're not really much of an accountant. You're really more of an entrepreneur. You should own your own business. And that moment struck me, Albert, where I said, I need to do something on my own. I need to be my own man. I've done this before where whether big business or small business, I've been able to do a business and create cash to get my desired outcome in life. And so I started Alliance when I was in my early 20s and bought my first deal. 
And, I, and like you said, I raise equity from high net worth investors and family offices. We've done institutional money. And I did my first deal. I bought a 95,000 square foot industrial building. And 95,000? Yeah, 95,000. How much was uh, it? At that industrial is a little bit less per square mm -hmm. foot. Back then, it was probably, say, a $2.8 million deal, $3 million deal. But I had to raise a lot of money. And, and the other thing, Albert, I had to get a loan. And you know, being in the mortgage banking and brokerage business, when you're young, especially in commercial, it's not easy to get a loan. I don't have a balance sheet. I have no net worth. I have no track record, no experience. So people say, well, how did you get the loan? So I went to my godfather. His name was Bruno Bertucci, God rest his soul. And I went to him because he sat on a bank, local bank in my hometown. And it was the only bank I knew. And it was the only bank I knew that would give a loan on commercial real estate. Yeah. So I went to Bruno and I said, Bruno, I need a loan. Here are all the numbers. Here's the deal. It's a great deal, so on and so forth. Can we get this done? He went into the loan committee, took my package. They said, yeah, they'll give you a loan. They'll give you 80 LTV, which, but you're going to sign with recourse. Now, as a 23-year-old kid, signing with recourse really doesn't have much meaning when you don't own anything. Right. What are they going to do, shake me upside down over a cliff and get a couple pennies out of me? No, they want to keep me vested. So we did the deal. Fast forward, uh, lost 45% of the income in the first week. We backfilled it, made a three-tenant building, and we sold it for about a 3x multiple. And that moment showed me, taught me a lot of lessons in the deal. It showed me what we need to do, what we can improve on, and it helped launch us. We built 12 million square feet of office industrial. We're office industrial and retail experts. Um, we're one of the largest medical office owners in the United States, and we just launched 90 days ago a multifamily division which we're going to start doing deals shortly. I'm excited about. And then we started a hard money lending division uh, at Alliance as well to help become a lender. And so we're doing that. So we have a lot of exciting stuff going on in my company. Um, some people label me as a futurist because I take risk before others. I'm willing to step out on the ledge and not worry about it and kind of manage my fear. And we are heavily into AI. Uh, we're getting into the blockchain significantly. Um, and then on the side, I invest in different companies. I sit on boards. And so I'm very active. I'm very passionate about what we do. And one of the things that encouraged me about being on this podcast is, you know, you do personal development. It's been a staple in your story. And it's been a staple in my story as well. And that's helped me really become the person I am today. Yeah. Yeah, so we've been, we're going on year nine of the Driven events, mm -hmm. nine years. So like what motivated me to do that was because uh, Grant mm -hmm. uh, was my, one of my first like multi-millionaire mentors that I, that I hired mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then Patrick Bedavid too. I don't know if you've, you've met Patrick Bedavid, but. Never met him, yeah. but I, I do follow his stuff. I really yeah. enjoy watching him. So both of them, very different mentors, mm -hmm. but I, I, I paid him. So yeah. I paid him for their time, mm -hmm. and and then eventually after after years of uh, just being under Grant, mm -hmm. I kept buying everything, kept investing in him, and just kept paying him, paying him, paying him, and and I and and I I became his best mentee. Like out of his first his first seminar in Cancun, he had thirty people in it, mm -hmm. like 30, 35 people max. I was one of those. Everybody uh, everybody from there is gone. Like I'm the only one that started a business and grew and, and kept following him. Mm -hmm. But long story short, like he, he told me, hey, when you make a million, uh, I'll put you at, on the 10X stage. Mm -hmm. then, then he said, nah, when you make millions. And then I, so I, I got to two million. Mm -hmm. So the, he, he just, then he said, well, no, you're not good for the stage uh, yet because you don't have a following. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started noticing, damn, you know what? It's not just about being successful or being good at what you do. Because if nobody knows you, you can't scale. Right. So then that's when I started learning about marketing and growing the brand, like right. we were talking earlier. So I just said, you know what? I can't wait. I can't, I can't keep waiting. I'm just going to start my own event. So I started my own event right after 10X. And then I just copied everything he was doing. So, so he had his 10X conference. I said, we're going to do the Driven conference. Then he did his business boot camp. I said, we're going to do our Driven business boot camp. So we started growing it, and, and I saw like he hired other speakers to go to his events, or speakers spoke for free at his events. So I started 
going after s like similar speakers. And then we just did the first one, the second one, the third one. The f it, it was, it's, been, it's been quite a journey as well. But uh, if it weren't for like Tony Robbins. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen. And me going there and walking on fire when I was really defeated and really, really broke like after 2008 that I lost everything, like I needed hope. So I remember I went to the Tony Robbins uh, seminar and, and I walked on fire and, and it, I could afford a, all I could afford was like a $99 ticket. Yeah. And I sat in the back and, and I was like, I, I came out of there like motivated. I'm like, you know what? Uh, 2008 wasn't that bad. Sleeping in the car, being homeless for two, for two months and, and, and sticking with the mortgage industry. It's not that bad. Like I'm, al I'm alive, I'm healthy, I'm young. Uh, my parents are alive. Uh, I have quality people in my life. It's not the end of the world. Right. So like, I think most people get stuck when they have a failure or a big one. And self-improvement has really been huge uh, in, in my life. And, and um, I, I, I like how you said that it's also been a big, huge part in your life. Mm -hmm. When being th over 30 years in business, right? Mm -hmm. Yourself? Yeah. W w from your company. Did you ever have any uh, years or maybe it was year five or year 10 or year 20? Or did you ever have any scary moments where you were like, oh, man, uh, <laughs> uh, this investment didn't go so well oh, or yeah. I lost a lot of money or, oh, yeah. or you went negative? I had a, a billionaire that was uh, in one of my my small masterminds a couple weeks ago. And he was talking about he had an exit and he sold his company for lots of millions of dollars. And then only to find himself like a year later, negative seven million, mm -hmm. negative seven million. So when you think, oh, man, I have problems, I owe uh, a few million or hundreds of thousands of dollars. He was he went from selling and buying a jet and all this stuff to be negative seven million. Mm -hmm. So with, with your business, uh, how, how has it been since you opened uh, when since you started? Have you ever had any scary moments that, and any tips? Yeah, you I mean, give people? I, you know, the. Albert, the reason why I am heavily into personal development is to manage my emotions. And when I was in my 20s, I didn't really understand it, personal development. I mean, and, no one and you still do it. Yeah, I still do it. You're not you're, you didn't you didn't. Oh, you no, don't feel like well, you're at the point where, you know, everything. Oh no, it doesn't stop. If you're going to continue to scale, you have to work on yourself every day. But you need better mentors now, right? You need higher level. Well, ones, I, I mean, and I could talk. I have mentors from all over the world. Um, in different facets. I have, me I have mentors that help me emotionally. I have mentors that help me with my staff internally. Uh, I have mentors that help me with uh, commercial real estate. I have some of the top guys that some have passed away that help me in commercial real estate. Been tremendous. And I'll tell you a story about that. But I believe in mentors, um, and I believe in mentors that align with you is important. I don't believe in having a mentor that doesn't care about you, that takes advantage of a person. Um, I got into the personal brand social media space uh, in May of 25, it'll be three years. So I haven't been in it that long. Now, I've been on LinkedIn because Jeff Weiner's from Chicago and those guys are from Chicago and I have a lot of following on LinkedIn. I've been working with that program since it started. But my staff said, well, that's not really social media. And I said, well, why do I need a social media? They said, because you have so much knowledge and experience, you should be sharing it with the world. You have an obligation. And I thought about it. I took a step back and I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to show my successes. We'll talk about weaknesses and failures. And I'm going to teach people how to invest in commercial real estate the right way. Because the baby boomers above me never wanted to teach. They never wanted to teach you, and they want to reveal secrets. What I find, and there's a younger guy in my space named um, Brandon Turner, who I like a lot. I was on his podcast in Maui. And Brandon and I were talking about this, and it's like the more we give, the more deal flow we get, more investors. Like It just keeps coming. It's abundance. And yeah. so I've learned to create a world of abundance and not fear. Uh, I don't make decisions out of fear. Um, and allows me to manage risk and to continue to grow and scale. And a lot of that comes from personal development. What happened, Albert, was I've been wildly successful about 
10 to 12, it was about 12 years ago. Yeah. I was looking in the mirror and I was shaving. And I would, didn't like the person I was looking at. I was looking at a gruff Chicago guy that was hard nosed, wasn't empathetic to people. They thought they had to keep up with me. And I took a step back and I said, you know, if we're going to continue to grow and we're going to deal with technology, and I have a lot of younger people that work for me and a lot of women, Ben Reinberg needs to change. Not everyone else around me. I have to change. And that's when I doubled down and I started working on myself. So how, how uh, old were you back, back when this happened? Probably in my 40s. I was probably about your age where I realized and I woke up and I said, I have to change. And so I heard a guy from South America who was well known, who was big in personal development space. And, and he worked with me for about three years. And then I had other mentors working for me as well. And what it allowed me to do is start changing. And then my leadership team and staff said, what's going on with him? He, he seems different. And it was, it was because I was more empathetic. I was a better listener. My communication skills improved from doing all this. And I realized that if we're gonna continue to scale and grow and offer different asset class and produce massive wealth for investors, which what we do for a living, I have to be the best version of myself so I show up well in front of others. And if I'm gonna get into this personal brand space, which I'm in, I have to even step it up even further. And so I am driven when it comes to personal development. It doesn't stop. If you're going to scale for everyone out there listening, you have to continually to work on yourself. Because we always say, you know, they ask the question, Albert, like, well, if you can go back in your 20s, what would that look like? I would work on myself. I didn't know when I was in my 20s. I thought, you know, you'd stick your so, head down and So you started self-improvement in, in your 40s? Yeah, I started self-improvement in my 40s. I was and already successful. I didn't yeah. need to do all this. I didn't need to start a personal brand. I didn't need to deal with the headaches. But I did it because it allows me to give back. It allows me to brand our company in my name, where it allows me to take the opportunities to help create a legacy, but also help my leadership team. Because eventually I have to step out of the company. You know, yeah. I've been doing this a long time. I want to get involved in other things. And they're basically running the company now. So for them, I want them to get all the attention. I want my brand and the company's brand to really help them grow and escalate and scale. And it starts with me. And personal development is critical. I'm a big fan of it. Um, it's allowed me to really reflect and see a situation, Albert, and say, what can I have done better? What was the truth in that situation when someone – so I love when people criticize me because to me it's growth. I embrace it. You want to criticize me? Great. I'll, I'll grab whatever who, who nugget Who criticizes is. you? You have, oh, a, you, have a, oh, you have a billion boy, dollar real estate. Oh, believe uh, me, people do. People do. Oh, I hear even my kids criticize me. I mean, it, you don't, you don't yeah. like, it doesn't stop. Are you married? Yes. So it doesn't stop. Does your wife criticize you? Oh, of course. Uh, but what, what happens is, is that when something's not right, or someone's emotional, they're always going to seek outside uh, behavior of why, what created this. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's Ben's fault or it's Albert's fault. Yeah. And that's just human behavior. And so what ends up happening in life that I see is that if you can look at yourself and say, okay, well, why did this situation happen? And a lot of it, what I see in situations, especially with employees and our leadership team and our outside resources, we have a tremendous amount of people around the country that are part of the Alliance universe, is it's always communication. It's, uh, that's one thing, Albert, I hate about texts and direct messages is that I went through a situ situation the other day. I said something to an employee, and she took it the wrong way. She said, why are you being so mean? I go, I'm not being mean. I'm just being direct because – we're in the middle of a hurricane. That sounds like my assistant. Yeah, we're in the middle of a hurricane. But it's not that he's being mean. His time is limited. So when your time's limited and you're really busy, so and you just make a comment, and maybe there's not enough follow-up behind it, and you'll take it wrong. So communication is a huge thing, and it's something I constantly work on with personal development. It's part of my repertoire. And so I feel where relationships and 
things go awry or things go well yeah. is when you have good communication. So, what's, so the, what's the solution for the text messages? You know, it's interesting. I'm a big phone guy. I am so old school. I like Albert, you want to talk to me? I like talking to you on the phone. Okay. Um, there's a lot of people that I interact with. They're just text and email. And the problem is people take things out of context. They, they don't understand. And so I preach to everyone in my company. I say, pick up the phone. Pick up, and all my leadership team and, and even employees underneath them in departments know if you're going to talk to Ben Reinberg, he'll talk to you on the phone. Uh, you could text me like, hey, can you call so me I could, in five minutes? I could call you and you'll pick up the phone? For sure. Always. Um, but, what, call but, myself. What, but what if you're like, because somebody like you, I'm sure, is busy all the time. And I'm you're really back to busy. Back to back, so yeah. like, sometimes like last thing you want is for your phone to ring when you're like well, about to jump into another thing. Like Here's how, how I deal with it. So my assistant, Carla, deals with my schedule. Mm -hmm. Every morning, 7 a.m., she calls me. I'm driving to go see my trainer, and she'll run me through my calendar. I'll be like, all right. She'll be like, you have a meeting with Albert at 11 a.m. It's a Zoom. Here it is. Boom, boom, boom. Maria, take notes. So so we we do that. And then at 4 o'clock, we meet to talk about the next day. Now, a lot of people will leave messages on my cell phone. I might say, Carla, can you follow up them? What I like to do is um, if it's something important or it's a personal friend, you know, obviously I'm going to pick up. Uh, but generally speaking, if I'm on a Zoom call or I'm being interviewed or I'm traveling or I'm flying and I can't pick up, I will definitely follow up. Usually yeah. I follow up with someone within 24 hours or Carl is going to reach out to that person. So, for example, okay, I'm driving. I want to call Sammy today. But I'm driving and I'm like in L.A. traffic and I'm like, all right, well, I'm on the phone with Carla. She called me to have our meeting. And I'm like, can you do me a favor? Can you call Sammy and tell her so Albert knows I'm going to arrive at this time? Mm -hmm. That's communication. So I'm big on communicating. I'm big on using the phone. To answer your question about texting, I think you use it as a source of follow-up in a, in, a, in a certain way. But I don't feel that you should use it to communicate your whole story you want to someone. Human er people want to be interacted uh, in person, either in person or on the phone. That's how we interact as humans. And, the, and technology has taken over where someone sends an email, someone sends a text. Have you ever texted your wife, Albert, and she gets pissed at you? Because maybe you're busy, maybe you were curt with her, um, maybe you weren't being thoughtful or empathetic in a situation. And that's her lens. That's how she's viewing it. But you're looking at it and saying, honey, um, I'm taking the kids to their sporting event. I have two minutes. I sent you a quick text. She looked at it differently than you looked at it. That's the problem with text. It's yeah. the problem with direct messages. And so I'm very careful because I've realized, and I'm constantly checking myself, I've sent, I've been on a plane, and I've sent communication to people. And they misinterpret it. And I'm like, oh, shit, they're going to misinterpret After I send it, I'm like, they're going to misinterpret it. And it happens. So I'm a big um, proponent of if you really want to get your message across and you really want to build a relationship, pick up the phone. Pick up the phone because it's more efficient. You know, you go back and forth on a text, okay, and I know, like, younger generation, people in their 20s, 30s, they want to text. That's how I, I have kids in their, tw in, in their 20s. I get it. They get mad at me when they say, Dad, why would you, why'd you call me? What do you mean, why did I call you? I, I, mm. I, I, I pay bills. Yeah. It's cause sometimes you call people, too, and, and, you know, like, some people like to talk a lot. Yep. So sometimes you, you call. There's people that are quick, but yep. there's some people that you call them for two minutes. Yep. And it turns into 30 minutes, and then you don't want to be rude and kind of cut them off. Well, you know how you handle that. It's, so, for example, if I call you, and I know I have a meeting in 10 minutes, yeah. I might say, look, I got 10 minutes, I'm walking into a Zoom, but I wanted to call you to talk to you because here's my schedule. I want to have dinner with you Wednesday night. I'm going to be in town. Are you free? You might be like, let me check my schedule. Great. Yeah. Shoot me a, t now we could go to text. Shoot me a text with your schedule, and I'll have Carla follow up with you, and we'll coordinate it. Boom. Done. Car Carla's your, your executive uh, assistant. Yeah, she's my personal assistant. Yeah. And so that allows me to be able to be efficient, but also I could hear your voice like, 
and you might and I might hear you on the other line and you're upset about something. I'm like, hey, you want to talk later? I, I, I'm everything okay. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over thirty million dollars a year, text me at two one three two seven seven six two zero eight and let's make it happen. You can't do that on a text. There's no human element emotion. Yeah, yeah, so if people understand that, so when it comes to commercial real estate. The reason why we're successful is because of communication. We get on the phone. Every deal we do, we have a tradition where I get everyone involved in the transaction. We get on a Zoom call now. Yeah. We used to do face-to-face. -face. Now we do Zoom. So it could be the seller. It could be us as a buyer. It could be the well, attorneys. Why, why, why Zoom and not face-to-face -face anymore? Because we have people all over the country, and we have sellers that are selling us property in all different states yeah. throughout the country because we buy in different states throughout the United States. So, and Zoom is important versus uh, just phone call, right? Exactly. Yeah, you, you wanna you, you wanna person. see the face, you wanna see the body language, the expression, you wanna see where someone gets heartburn over an issue. What's important? The the eyes and the body doesn't doesn't lie to you when you're on the Zoom call. So we we'll have everyone on the call. I generally lead them and say, okay, we're buying this property outside Orlando. Uh, I walk through the deal. What I like to do is make sure we're all on the same page as we're negotiating a purchase and sale agreement for a piece of commercial real estate and our deals are big and we're investing a lot of money, a lot of time, and it's an opportunity cost. I like to make sure that we're always on the same page. I wanna make sure we know what the terms are. Mm -hmm. If we're creating a lease, it's a sale lease back. Here are the terms of the lease we agreed to. Here's the price. By the way, this is how we work. It's a full transparent process, and we're gonna tell you where we're at, we're gonna tell you when engineers and third party uh, consultants are going out to inspect the property, when we're doing a environmental study. Oh, by the way, we're gonna finance the property, um, and so we're gonna bring an appraiser through. Uh, oh, by the way, our attorney Glenn is gonna oversee the title. We're gonna use one of our title companies who's around the country. So it allows everyone to make the transaction very smooth. In a commercial real estate transaction, it's very sophisticated. There's a lot of moving parts. Sometimes there's hair on a deal you have to deal with, which means there's issues that you have to, or challenges you have to overcome. Yeah. And when you set the table in a transaction and you have everyone in there and, you, and someone leads like I do and say, this is what it's gonna look like from start to finish, and you actually do it, and any challenges you communicate up front, because we need financial statements, we need leases, we need, you know, what improvements have you done? It's a lot of information. And so human nature wants to be touched and interacted. Like, wow, these guys at Alliance are really professional. If you want to build rapport, and I say this in any business, it's the way you communicate and it's your expertise on a topic you're speaking about. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to prove to you I bought billions of dollars of commercial real estate. I don't need to prove to you I've raised hundreds and hundreds and billions of dollars of, of equity in my career. I don't need to prove to you I built a lot of square footage in my career. When I talk and I explain the process, my experience oozes out of me. That's what builds rapport. So people out there, if you're younger and you're buying real estate or you're in the mortgage business or any business, you coach, whatever you do, I don't care if you sell stuff on Instagram, work on your craft build your expertise and take your ego out of it and educate people that will automatically transpose into you're an expert or you understand what you're doing and so when we do this process about getting everyone on the phone and i lead it it naturally builds rapport of ben reinberg's been in the end zone before. Yeah. He's done this before. He closes deals. He understands the process. He understands the issues that can arise in the process. But also he has the capital to close too because he wouldn't know all this stuff if he wasn't able to close a deal. Yeah. And so for everyone out there listening is you can build rapport naturally, but work on yourself. Personal development's huge. And really work on your craft. Really focus down on your niche. And so for me, my business is commercial real estate. I'm a commercial real estate expert, okay? I understand business, I'm also a CPA, and I understand numbers. But the bottom line is, when I am online, and if you follow me on Instagram and all the different social media platforms, 
not only am I talking about business, my experience to help you is why I'm online, but I'm talking about my expertise in commercial real estate. I'm not telling you about your mindset. I'm not going to tell you um, how to solve relationship problems. Yeah, I've been through all those things, but I'm going to preach to you where I've developed my expertise, and I hope someone out there can get a nugget or a piece of information. It's why people say to me, why do you go on podcasts? It's a lot of time. It probably costs you a lot of money because it's my way to give back. If we're on this podcast together, Albert, and someone listening out there, a young man or woman or whoever, starting a business or they're in business or they're going through a challenge, if they take anything I say and it helps them in their life, that's a win. And I look at my wins. And so coming up here is a win. Spending time with you is a win. And one thing I learned for everyone out there is that as a young man or woman, you're in business or you're an employee, you always got your head to the grindstone, right? You're always worrying about your boss or you're worrying about your business and, and you worry about your health. Mm -hmm. But if you take a step back and say, what went well today and you appreciate it and you're grateful for it, life is so much better. We're always focusing on what went wrong today. Instead of saying, wait a minute, I had a good day. I did eight great things. I got this done. I accomplished this. But we're always gravitating to the thing that went wrong, and that, that tells our story. Yeah. And so, um, and it's why, to me, mental health is important to me. Um, most people don't know this, but uh, I have two older brothers. My middle brother is mentally ill. Um, uh, mental health is extremely important to me. He's in Chicago. And it's something that's emotional for me when I talk about it because I saw a young man in my middle brother who was very successful, computer engineer, graduated from Miami University, Miami, Ohio. And I saw the struggles he had. And so health is something extremely important. People say, well, why do you work out so much? And why do you take care of yourself and you eat right? And and you're into this biohacking and stuff is that because the best version of Ben Reinberg allows me to help others, but also be able to show up as the best version of myself. And so health and mental health is important to me. So you, so you said you're, you're both of your brothers? No, just my male brother. My no. oldest brother's retired, who's been wildly successful. Um, but my middle brother is mentally ill and uh is he, he all right is, is, he, is he is he is he he's in a place that um that takes care of him mm. but it's sad it's hard it's been very hard on me because um when your middle brother sees your now your older brother you look up but your youngest brother having great success in a family do you, it's, do you, it's do a you hard think pill. that was part of it because he saw he had he had a lot of pressure from his older brother that was really successful then then the then his little brother's like kicking off and then he feels like left out I, I think it's hereditary um but i think i think it has part of what you said has an impact on people it must put a lot of uh, a lot of pressure on, on it it puts a lot of pressure it, it it puts i have a lot of guilt from it from being successful because i look at him and how talented he was and i looked up to him when i was a kid and so it's hard for me i have a lot of guilt in being successful when I think about him. But when you, know? you were growing up, mm -hmm. uh, was was he was he good? And then he just kind of like yeah, switched? Yeah, so it, like it started was um, he came down. He was graduating from Miami of Ohio, and he was a senior. I was a freshman in Indiana. And Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, and Oxford, Ohio are a few hours from each other. Yeah. So he came down for a, a big weekend. I was in a fraternity, and, and – uh, that's when I noticed things weren't right. It was like the, and I remember calling my parents and saying, you know, something with Rob isn't, isn't right. And, uh, and they said, really? And I said, yeah. And, and I think it kind of started there and it just kept growing and growing and, uh, it's been challenging. And so for me, um, it's, it's been a point in my life to really reflect back on what's important, you know, um, Money allows me to use a tool to help people. It it's a tool that I talk about because your health is a tool. Your resources, your colleagues, the people you interact with, your inner circle, the people you surround yourself, these are all tools that we yeah. have. 
And so I talk about because people say, well, like, when I have money, how do I deal with it? Because if you don't balance yourself and deal with your emotions, you'll go broke. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happens to a lot of people, Albert, is that so it always comes back to personal development and being Cause, cause great there's, with there's yourself. Because there's different levels of, of money. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have uh, you own a billion dollars in real estate, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the return on that I is like ten percent, five percent, twenty. Well, it just depends on the property. I mean, yeah. we make hundreds of millions of dollars for investors, and so, and I've been doing this a long time. Um, I don't do it for money. So I d I do it for because I love what I do and I enjoy the process and the people and the but, growth. But and but, the but it's safe to say that like you have a, a you make a very good chunk of money yeah, you could I, have, you could I've have done, any life you want I, I, yeah I've done very well yeah but but so the difference between me and what you'll see in other people is I am extremely humble because that's how I learned the business I've learned from some of the top icons yeah. in business in the world and they said they said you never have to prove yourself you never have to show people how successful you are you just have to live the life you want and and just keep pushing forward. And so for me, one of the things I see online is, you know, people taking pictures with jets and doing this and doing that. And that's great, but it shouldn't define you. Mm -hmm. What should d define you is what's your legacy? What do, you, what do you do? How do you help people? How do you use your money properly? I mean, it was, you know, when you talked about Dan Fleischman, he said, are you gonna leave all your money to your kids? And I said, no. I said, I want my kids to yes, make their, yeah. yeah, and I want my kids to make my own life. It was a great question because he had me, he actually like took me off guard when he asked me and I started thinking, he's like, he's like, has anyone ever asked you? I said, one person did, but I don't think I answered it. And he goes, well, let's answer it. And I go, okay, I'll answer it. And I thought about it. I said, no, I'm not because I'm investing in them to give the skill sets they need to be wildly successful, which they will. But I realize I see people is that you should never have to prove yourself because it goes back to uh, your expertise. It yeah. goes back to being driven and and how you're going to create impact and help people. And what I see um, in businesses, a lot of businesses, people let their egos get involved and say, well, I have to keep up with this. Or if people would just live within themselves yeah. and and know that their success rides off of what they do. Not what other people think. Don't you them. feel like people that show off a lot mm -hmm. don't really have a lot of money, and the people that have a yeah. lot of money, yeah, extreme amount of money, yeah. they don't really show off. Yeah, and I have a lot of friends that are very extremely wealthy. I have a lot of investors that are very wealthy, and they they've taught me a lot through the years because I just watch and see, and you would never know how wealthy they are. You know, they're they're humble people and because they know that there's no reason for it. Yeah. It's their actions show how wealthy they are. They show what their lifestyle is. Um, you know, and so for me, I always felt that um, I never want to show people what I have. It was the hard, Albert, when my leadership team came to me and said, you gotta get online, I'm like, why do I wanna do that? Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask I don't wanna, I don't want. it was uncomfortable for me. I was like, I gotta, tell people my successes and what I've done and and deals we've done and I'm like that's not me that's showing off but I realize what it does to teach people and how people learn and so I have a lot of people that DM me I have a lot of I'll be traveling somewhere and some young man I was on a plane and some guy grabbed me and said you know I really liked when you spoke about this or I saw you on stage and you spoke about leverage and it really taught me about how to get in a room and find what I'm looking for. And so I did a speech, I did a talk recently on leverage. I was on a big stage and, and it was a big audience and it was a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs and, and people that were driven. Yeah. And, I, and we talked about it and I, one of the things I talked about was what are you gonna do differently to achieve what you want in this room? And, and what can you do to change your paradigm as you're in this room? And we talk about it. And so he pulled me aside and he said, you know, you made me think. 
And that's what I want. When I'm on social media, I want you to think. It goes back to my new TV show, which got spun off from a podcast. And what I love about my podcast now show is that I want you to think. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen. But what I do differently is I do a front to camera. Because if you're on my show, you might say something and the audience maybe doesn't understand what Albert just said. So I'll pop up and I'll say, here's what you have to think about. Here's how you can implement it. So it's very educational. Because for me, that's what it's about. Most people talk online or on social media, but no one goes deep enough to explain what it really means. And I want to do things differently. I've, my whole career in life, I've been different. I don't follow the norm. I don't accept the word can't or won't or shouldn't, Albert. I don't believe in that. I believe in how do we get it done? How do we do something? How do we use the blockchain? How do we use AI? Um, how do we open up a new asset class? Uh, how do I help this person? So I believe that what truly defines an entrepreneur and gets into your point of any struggles I've had where maybe a deal doesn't work out or I buy a $50 million office campus in St. Louis and, and Warren Buffett pulls out of two floors and now I'm and now I'm in default on my loan and I got to work it out and deal with it. And thank God we sold it and broke even. But when things are tough, how are you going to deal with it? That's why I say to an entrepreneur, anyone out there that's an entrepreneur, a business owner, whatever you're doing, you're going to face challenges. So when you're in the face of a challenge, how are you going to deal with it? That defines a man or woman to me is when things are tough. Because people say to me, well, people invest in Alliance all the time. Yeah, because we're solutionary oriented. We yeah. know how to deal with challenges. We have 200 plus years of leadership team yeah, experience yeah, yeah. that handle these issues. Right. But when I invest in someone, my first question is, how do you deal with the challenge? Yeah. S speaking of that, yeah. uh, do, do you sell like any coachings or do you, do, do you coach people? It's, it's a great question because I have a we're, start, question. Yeah, we're starting to create courses yeah. because it's something I want to do. I, my goal in life is I would love being from Chicago and the south side of Chicago is a very rough area if you know Chicago. It's most yeah. homicides in the world. And I said to someone on my staff, I said, I said, what would be a cool project to do that we could do a show off of? I said, if I could take a young man or woman from the south side of Chicago that wants to build wealth, bring them in our organization and teach them the business and let them start helping them acquire commercial real estate and build equity and maybe help them create their own company. What type of impact would that have on them hiring people in their community and building cash flow and maybe helping their parents get out of a different situation or they go buy their first home yeah. or rent a nice place and maybe a safer area. And so, these are things I enjoy doing. And so we said, um, with all the work we're doing, we said, well, let's build some courses. Let's, let's let Ben, he teaches all the time and he mentors people in his business and people outside the company. Why don't we just start teaching it? And he'll start teaching. How do you find a piece of commercial real estate? How do you pick a niche? How do you finance a piece of real estate? Whether it's residential work, what I do in commercial. And so we're starting to develop all this because it's something I enjoy doing. Um, we'll probably create a mastermind group as well to help people. And it's interesting because no one in commercial real estate really does what I do. Yeah. No one appeals to a younger generation, but no one also deals with an older generation at the same time, and I do both. And what is important to me is to expose the business to enough people because not enough people teach commercial real estate and not enough pe people teach it the right way. And so I think I could be the leader in that. And I feel that there's a real opportunity in the public to say, you know what, this guy's going to help us get our foot in the door to start acquiring commercial real estate because he's been there, done that, yeah. and he understands all the nuances that go on in, in investing in it. I, I heard you say that one of, your, one of your tips to success, especially for a lot of uh, youngsters watching this, mm -hmm 
is li living below your means. Yep. C can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, L like, why didn't you get crazy when you made a lot of money and yeah. went out and got your new because and all that stuff? I always thought I have to protect my downside. I also looked at it and said, well, how do I want to come off to my kids? Do I want to have like five cars and a Ferrari and a McLaren and stuff? And unless I'm really passionate about cars, which I like, what does that show to them? How old are your kids? So they're in their 20s okay. and my youngest is 19. So it's a bo boy and or so, girl? Or? Uh, two boys and a girl. Okay. And so I looked at it and I said, well, how do I want to be represented to them? And also as I grew in success, I said, I also don't want to be a target. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of crazy people out in the world. And so Albert, I looked at it and I said, if I'm happy with one car, I drive right now a Tesla Plaid. I could drive whatever I want. I, I, I have and, one. and I love it. I love it. It's a great car. It, it's it, saves me from accidents. There's great qualities it's about a lot. It's it's, it's it's one of the fastest off the line. Um, you don't drive fast. And though? so what's that? You don't you don't speed. Oh, I speed all the time. Yeah. I sp I was speeding on Sunset coming here, but uh, but um, but for me, it's like I also want to simplify my life. Yeah. It's like if I have five houses, I can I own real estate all over the country. I. I already know how challenging it is. Now I gotta manage multiple houses and, and hire staff and manage staff. So I try to make my life simple. I don't need to overcomplicate it. And you know, when I wanna go on a nice trip, I'll go on a nice trip. When I want to um, uh, do something nice, I'll do something nice. I eat, I'm a big foodie. I like to go out to great places. But it goes back to, I never forget where I came from. I was a Chicago kid who didn't come from money, who grew his business, who's helped people. And I don't, I don't remember, I don't yeah. forget the day I started because I was that driven young man and I'm still the same driven kid inside an older so you, man. So you like to go to dinners like a lot? Yeah, I like going like dinners. I like to travel. How, how often do you go to dinners and, and do you have like oh a healthy, uh, a healthy uh, eating ha habits? Yeah. Do, you, do you drink liquor or? or I don't drink. Um, I don't drink anymore. I stopped drinking a couple of years ago. Why was uh, that? I did. I was doing stem cell therapy, mm -hmm. and the doctor, who's a dear friend of mine, said, "You know, Ben, you can't drink for ninety days." And uh, so, were you, were you, did you did you like drinking before? Well, that? I, I I collected wine. I mean, that's like and that kind of stuff. And well, I had a wine cellar in Chicago, in my house. I had about seven hundred bottles. Damn. And I was big into it. I learned, I got into a group in commercial real estate where uh, it allowed me to network with guys well above me, yeah. okay, and be able to send a case of wine to them every quarter, one person in the group. And they're all icons in commercial real estate. It allowed me to learn the business, grow, learn how to deal with challenges. It was a wonderful thing. As I got into wine, I started learning about it. I go, wow, this is a fascinating business. I'm really into this. And I started writing notes when I'd send a case and reading the tasting notes. And I went to all these vineyards and started learning more. And so that was part of why I drank. And then, you know, and then bourbon got popular and different vodkas and, 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 and mezcals and tequila and became popular. So I would try it. And I always had a drink with dinner when I would go out. And so after I had stem cells done and I, I couldn't drink because it hurts the stem cells, I said, wow, you know what? I kind of like not drinking. I like the way I show up. I like the fact that I don't need a drink. And so I stopped, it was about a couple years ago, and it was a great decision. It helps you keep your weight down. You know, you're in great shape. Um, I don't drink beer, and even though I used to love beer. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, I got it out of my life, and, and you know what? You wake up, you feel better, you're healthier, you look better, you, you act better. And so for me, I don't need alcohol. So to answer your question about food is, I eat healthy, yeah. I eat a lot of fish and vegetables. Um, even though I love sugar, I try to stay away from dessert. Yeah, yeah. Um, my daughter is a huge baker. Um, she wants to open up bakeries and she's at an incredible hospitality yeah. school out east. And so um, that's always an issue. And, and your, your, your wife is the mother of your children or no? Yeah, the mother yeah. of my children. How long have you been married for? We've been married now 
28 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. She doesn't drink either? No, she drinks. Yeah. She, she likes to drink Cause, a lot. Because, uh, Ben, I, I get it that you feel great, mm -hmm. you know, like two years no uh -huh. drinking. Yeah. But I don't know, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like I enjoy, I don't drink liquor. Right. Like sometimes I'll have a margarita. Right. But I, I, I quit liquor uh, years ago mm -hmm. because I just, it, it, it affects me differently now. Yeah. When I was younger, I could drink vodka, tequila. So I, I, I stopped drinking liquor. Yep. But uh, I only drink champagne. I, I, I love champagne. Interesting. Uh, I don't know about, about you, but I'm sure you've, you've flown private, right? Mm -hmm. Before? Yep. So like when, when you fly private, it's, it's so expensive and it's an experience. It's, it just feels cool. Mm -hmm. Like I like to have like a glass, a nice cold glass of champagne when when um, we're flying private, or or, uh -huh. or when we're, when we go to a tropical beach area, like yeah. you go to maybe Cancun uh -huh. or, or Cabo uh -huh. or Hawaii. Uh -huh. There's just something about a vacation and having like a nice cold one, or even a cold Corona. Mm -hmm. Like it just feels like like good. Uh, you probably see your wife doing it, but you just refrain from it. Yeah, I I I'll urge? tell you what I do. Well, I mean. Collecting wine, loving wine, I'll have a gl I will have a glass of wine in the future. I'm not gonna yeah, not have it. I mean, and because what, what what if you what if you die tomorrow or or if or and I'm not I'm not wishing yeah. any any bad. No. But, but what if today's your last do we, do day? We have do we have wood in the studio. <laughs> um, um, no, yeah, but not, if not if you you know, and if if I died next day and yeah. I, drinking's just not it's not important to me. It's not like something I need my health is everything yeah. and how I deal with people yeah. is important to me so um I it's just something that we, we were know, just we, it's, I was it's just it's it's yeah it's nice to celebrate yeah. and I, I I enjoy that part of it but for me personally um I want to be the best version of myself yeah. so what my, is my drink of choice if you ever go out to dinner with me you'll see I am a big sparkling water in a wine glass with ice and limes. Mm -hmm. That's it. And the waitress knows and tell her, and she's like, "Great." Puts it in the champagne bucket. Yeah. You know, and and people are drinking around me, and I think it's great. You want to drink great? I don't criticize or judge anyone. I want everyone to be happy and thrilled, yeah. and and I want everyone to enjoy the evening with yeah. me. And so for me, it's it's just it's it's just I learned, and I was yeah. like, you know what? I don't need a drink, and if I want to drink, I'll have a drink. Yeah. But um. I enjoy a great glass of wine, right. and I value it because of collecting it. But yeah. uh, at the end of the day, it's not important to me. It What's important to me is taking care of my health because the amount of decisions I have to make on a daily basis and the people that rely on my decisions are more yeah. important than Ben Reinberg having a drink. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then a, a few things to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I asked that, by the way, was because like I, I go on 30-day cleanses. Uh-huh. And and so like I'm very 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 strict. Uh huh. Zero alcohol, mm. only water, mm -hmm. chicken and fish all every day. Mm -hmm. uh, two workouts a day, and and it's, it's just and, and I f do feel great. I feel better. Mm -hmm. I feel like more clear. Yeah. But at the same time, I also feel like like I'm missing this, some of the fun stuff because I want to eat ice cream and I want to have a drink and things like that. But uh, I don't know if you know if you know Brad Lee and and uh, sure and, I know Brad and you know you know Andy Elliott. I don't know Andy. But you heard Elliott. about him, right? I've heard him on. But yeah. I I was on Brad's show, yeah. so I know. So Brad. so so he's to the extreme where, where where you have to get a you have to have a six pack or you're fired. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and yeah you I've can't, heard that. Yeah, no, like no yeah. alcohol. Yeah. Uh, and, and all this stuff. Yeah. and then Brad's Brad's like well I want to be happy so he wants to smoke his cigars uh -huh. he wants to eat bad yeah. uh, he he doesn't care about the six pack right and and then Brad says well I don't have to be super healthy to be successful I'm successful uh -huh. without all that shit right but but it's the two extremes yeah uh, so that's why I was asking uh, uh, before I ask you the last thing what is your routine because because you're 54 yeah and 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 you're very healthy uh -huh. uh, you work out you said uh -huh. that you've been working out very consistently. So how much does that help you with your success? Uh, and and how important how important is having your routine? And can you just talk about oh, your routine? Like, well, how everything. is it Monday through Sunday? Okay, so it's every day I do it. Um, it doesn't stop. Cold plunges I don't, or no? Uh, no, I, you know what? It's funny. People are like, why don't you buy a cold plunge? I, I haven't, I, I don't know if I have the time to, you know, I'm, I'm packing in so much before I go see my trainer, Andrew. So. What Andrew, Andrew and I train five days a week. And um, before I see him, I wake up and uh, 
do not check my phone. Uh, you I don't, don't check your phone? No, I won't check my phone for at least a half hour. Because okay. I know... I know there's hundreds of, e I get thousands of emails a day. I get text messages. And my let told me to do that. And what's that? Uh, to, not, to, he, not, to, to not, to not, check, to not look uh, at I agree with him. I've never met him, but I agree with him. It's, it's, he's right. Because then you start your day he's with right. stress. Oh yeah, you, you start your day. But not only that, I know what's on my phone. Yeah. I know like there's gonna be a problem, there's gonna be a challenge, someone's asking questions, um, something's flowing from the next day or week. And so for me, what I do is I get up, and uh, first thing I do, walk in the bathroom, and uh, brush my teeth, get ready, and then I and then I sit down and I meditate. I meditate from anything from 20 to 30 minutes, and I and I get my mind right. Then uh, shower, get dressed, and uh, pound anywhere from 25 to 34 ounces of of Mountain Valley water, like a water with like spring water that has alkaline that electro, just like you gave me. So is that 9.5 pH or? Uh, I don't know what it is, but yeah. it's great. This is 25 ounce. So I would drink something like this or a glass. I drink a lot of the glass waters on my way to Andrew. So you shower yeah. before you work out? Yeah, I do. It's yeah. a habit. I want to wake up. I also, for some reason, I think it's just like in part of me, I'm like, I want to like at least smell good for Andrew because he's all over me. He's near me, and I'm yeah. training hard with him. Because there's some there's me. some people that stink at the oh gym. in the gym. It's horrible. I've yeah. I've been like where they walk by you and you're like Ooh. I'll look at Andrew. I'm like we got to have like a shower rule. If like someone stinks and they have like three showers in this place I train, I'm like, can we just like tell the guy to go in and rinse off? Like that would be great. <laughs> but I haven't experienced it in a while. It's great. Everyone's fine. And so I yeah. liked because I, I don't want anyone to think that I stink. So I'm I'm into my hygiene. So I shower when I, when I get up after I'm done. Drive to Costa Mesa. I train with him. And it's challenging. He pushes me like I'm a 20-year-old. Yeah. And, um, and so we train and then get ready, go right into the office in Newport Beach. And by the time I'm getting in the office, and even, and I'll take calls on my way to Andrew, and I take calls on my way to the office. To so maximize your minutes. To maximize my time. Um, and I'm always trying to be efficient. And then when I get into the office, it's usually, you know, like a 10 to 12 Zoom call type days situation of some problems or. So you have uh, 10 to 12 Zoom calls? Usually in a day. Wow. At least. And uh, from all over the country, sometime outside the from country all your, all, from all your real estate deals it's just it could be employees it could be personal brand stuff it could be every day is different so mondays are pretty intense i do one-on-ones with every leader in my company i do probably half the leaders because i have someone else one-on-ones one-on-ones how long and, and how often depends on what you're doing so if you're in acquisitions and you're a leader of a certain department and depending on what's going on it might be half hour 45 minutes sometimes it'll be an hour um, depending on the person. Some one-on-ones could be 20, 25 minutes. Mm. Uh, I meet with people that are consultants of ours. I meet with lenders. Uh, some investors want to get on the phone with me. I do some of that. So it, it just every day is different. Every day is unique. I was telling your assistant how what I love about my business is I'll show up and in life and that day is going to be completely different. Like for example, Yesterday, I was telling her we woke up at 3.30 in the morning, had a meeting, Pacific, to have a meeting about uh, Hurricane Milton and how that was going to impact our portfolio and what that would look like. And so these are the things I do. And, and people say, well, they, I get asked all the time, how do you create success? How do you continue to do it? And it's my morning routine that allows us to, for me to, to be able to be consistent, dependable, and reliable. And so my morning routine is important. My evening routine is even more important. Um, I meditate. I read. Um, it's interesting. I'm actually doing Andy Frisella's program, 75 Hard. Oh, you are? And someone said to me, they go, I, they go, I think you'll get through it because I know you, but I think it would be good for you to see what Andy did because eventually I'm supposed to go on Andy's show, and I want to do it to be able to talk to him about it. I think it's awesome what he did. I really commend him for this. 
and it's a mental challenge. I'm on day, I'm halfway through. I'm on day 37, and he's right. You, you it's could, hard. You could have a 45 minute workout here for you. I could. Yeah. I, well, I've already worked out. Now I got to do my outside workout. Yeah. I got to drink my gallon of water. Again, that goes back to no alcohol. So, uh, really enjoying that, and uh, it's been great because it really shows me my discipline level. So for anyone out there that really wants to see your commitment level to something, you do 75 hard, you'll see how committed you are. And, and then you end your day at what time and then you head home? So I end my day, it's different. In California, I'm ending a little bit earlier because I'm dealing with time zones that are safe. two, three hours yeah. ahead of me. So it's a little bit different schedule. But um, generally speaking, I'll be done by six, come home, meditate, eat dinner, uh, and read. I try not to watch much TV. I don't really enjoy TV, um, especially the news these days. And uh, long story short, uh, go to bed. I try to be in bed by like 9.30 and start all over. And I'm very disciplined. And you, wait, you, and you said you wake up at 5? I'll wake up anywhere from 5 to 6 in the morning. And then the weekends day. are like family time or no work? Weekends are, I still work. But I'm at home, yeah. and I balance it. It might be an hour or two, depending on the situation. Um, but it's mostly family time. My kids are older, so yeah. uh, when I get time to spend with them, um, they both, two of my boys went to USC, so I'm a big USC football fan. Yeah. So we'll go to the games and stuff. Awesome. I try to find time. And you'll see as your kids get older, I know you have a new one coming. So well, we have uh, one that's one that's two, one yeah. that's five, and one that's eight. Okay, so they're young still, and so these are the moments you really want to gravitate to because yeah. well, they look up to dad, and that's, that's where I they need appreciate. Your, I'm, I'm gonna need a lot of advice. Oh, you I'll, can I'll, ask I'll, me anytime. I'll, I'll reach out, yeah. But for me, it's um, you. I try to find the times where I could spend with them because as they get older and they develop their own lives and their own careers, you want to find those moments where you can capture yeah. them. So. Makes a lot of sense. So, so then one last thing, I don't want to leave it out before we sure, wrap up. Sure. Uh, your, uh, so you, you built, uh, like super fast, you built a billion dollar real estate portfolio mm -hmm. without social media, right? Yeah. You just recently started your social media, right? Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't, know, I didn't even know you'd built, you'd be able to buy properties. But a billion dollars without social yeah. media versus. We've the, done, we've done billions of dollars in transactions and, and so, deals because. So what's, di what's different from you versus like, cause Grant Cardone has been doing it for a long uh -huh. time. Yeah. And he wasn't, he wasn't even near a billion. Uh huh. Uh, not too long ago, right? You built it without social media. He used right. a lot of social media. Like, right. how did you do it quicker, much quicker, and 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 without even using well, social media? I don't know if it's quicker. I've been doing this for three decades. I, I don't know Grant that well. I've I've followed him a little bit. I'm sure one day we'll meet. Um, I heard he's a phenomenal person. Um, but it's you know I'm in the commercial real estate space where I deal with people in our business all the time, and it's pounding the phone. It's having acquisition guy pounding phone. It's uh, we wrote we started writing a newsletter that's now a blog. I used to write it to hundreds of thousands of people to educate them, and so we would find deals. We would have deals coming to us. When it came to raising equity, is we use shoe leather. We would we would be getting referrals and hustling, and and now we're using using social media to raise equity, which I think is fascinating. Oh, wow. So I commend Grant because he's done it a different way and everyone does it differently and you yeah. respect it. And so I have a lot of respect for him and I, I wish him great things and, and, uh, and he's done it a little bit differently, but I've learned from him, like you could do things differently. I've learned yeah. from a lot of people, Ben Ryan, I don't have all the answers. It's my way is the best way yeah. you pick and choose and you learn from different people, how they do it and you can grow and learn from that. And so, um, no, I commend anyone that's had great success because I know how hard it is. I know the risk. Right. I know the sleepless nights. Yeah. I know the, the talk, the inner voices you have to deal with within yourself. Right. And so for me, um, I command anyone that's uh, working hard and creating su success. And, and that's gratitude. That's, that's appreciating. And, and you know what? I'm sure one day Grant and I will meet and we'll have great stories to tell and laugh. And because and you, you, you have a mutual respect for people that do deals, especially in our business. Yeah. 
Awesome, Ben. So, so we'll we'll ha we'll have to have a second one because yeah. it, there was so much more stuff that, that I wanted to cover. But like, for example, how how do you raise capital? Mm -hmm. uh, you you did it a long time ago, and I'm sure you've uh, you've learned a lot of new and better ways to do it. Doing it over 30 years, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll save it for the next for for the second uh, part. And uh, Ben, anybody here that wants to reach out, they want to follow you, they want to find you. Where is the best place to find you? The best place to find us is. To find me personally, go to benreinberg.com. That's my personal website. It will lead you to any social media platform, our new TV show, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, you can go to subscribe to ben.com. And if you want to follow our company and you want to invest in commercial real estate, invest with us passively, go to alliancecgc.com. You can also go to benreinberg.com if you want to invest. So we have a lot of people that want to get into commercial real estate, don't want to deal with the daily headaches we do, and want to invest and build wealth. And so if you go to one of those websites, we'll show you how you can invest with us, make a lot of money, and build build wealth. And I heard your family. returns are really good. Yeah, we're, we've done okay. We have yeah. mid-20s on medical. Uh, across our whole portfolio, our career, we're about 28 to 29% internal rate of return. Wow. So it's, it's safe, secure, profitable investing. That's yeah. what we thrive on. Yeah. Well, awesome, Ben. Thank you so much for part of the show. Hey, thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you. Can I get photos of it quick? Yeah, that'd I know be you got to get out by 1230, right? Yeah, that'd be great. 1224. Okay.